Amen. All right, there's two passages, actually two stories within this one chapter that I want to focus on. The title of the sermon is Having Discretion with God's Law. Having Discretion with God's Law. First, I want to look here and I want to begin in verse number 16, the story that we just read about Solomon being presented with two options here. Look at verse number 16. The Bible says, Then came there two women that were harlots under the king and stood before him. And the one said, the one woman said, <clears throat> Oh my Lord, I and this woman dwell in one house, and I was delivered of a child with her in the house. And it came to pass the third day after that I was delivered, that this woman was delivered also. And we were together. There was no stranger with us in this house, save we two in the house. And this woman's child died in the night because she overlaid it. And she arose at midnight and took my son from beside me, <coughs> while thine handmaid slept and laid it in her bosom, and laid her dead child in my bosom. And when I rose in the morning to give my child suck, behold, it was dead. But when I had considered it in the morning, behold, it was not my son which I did bear. And the other woman said, Nay, but the living is my son, and the dead is thy son. And this said, No, but the dead is thy son, and the living is my son. Thus they spake before the king. Then said the king, the one saith, This is my son that liveth, and thy son is dead. And the other saith, Nay, but thy son is the dead, and my son is the living. And the king said, Bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king. And the king said, Divide the living child in two, and give half to the one and half to the other. Then spake the woman, whose the living child was unto the king. For her bowels yearned upon her son, and she said, O oh my Lord, give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. But the other said, Let it be neither mine nor thine, but divide it. Verse 27, Then the king answered and said, Give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. She is the mother thereof. Now, I don't know about you, but I remember the very first time that I read through the Bible and I got to this passage, I thought, man... That is one of the coolest things that I've ever heard of. The way that he was able to stand there in judgment between these two, and then immediately he had the right wisdom or the right discretion or the right discernment in order to make that decision right on the spot and such a wise decision that he ended up making. I'm going to be talking about this morning having discernment or having discretion in our daily lives with God's law, using God's law throughout our lives and knowing and being familiar enough with God's law. Now, we may not be in the position of being a king or a judge or being a priest or what have you, but the Bible says in Revelation chapter number one, I believe it's verse six, either verse five or verse six, that God hath made us kings and priests, that he hath made us kings and priests in the New Testament. So we all need to be familiar with God's law. We all need to be prepared in our daily lives to make decisions to where we are able to judge, we are able to know the right answer or the right decision to make when we're at work. We know the right decision or the right answer that we need when we are out and about or we're confronted with something with family or whatever it may be. We need to know God's law well enough that we know what decision that we need to make. Now I want you to look in this same chapter at the very beginning of the chapter. Verse number one, I want to show you the importance of having wisdom with God's law or discretion or discernment with God's law. Look at verse number one. And Solomon made an affinity. Oh, I'm sorry, let's, let's skip down further. Verse five. <coughs> we'll skip that section. It's not necessarily relevant. In, the, in Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, ask what I shall give thee. And Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness that thou hast given him a son <coughs> to sit on his throne as it is this day. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father. And, and I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or to come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people which thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Look at verse 9. Give therefore thy servant. <coughs> we see the humility of Solomon. Give your servant, referring to himself as a servant when speaking to the Lord. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this thy so great a people? So notice that he asked for an understanding heart 
to judge the people. He wants an understanding heart to know the law well enough to know what decision to make when he is presented as the judge in this situation or in a situation. It says to know between, he says, he used the word discern between good and bad. Who is able to judge this thy so great a people? Verse 10, it says this, and the speech pleased the Lord. Notice that this was pleasing to God. This made God happy. He was happy with this, that, that he had requested, hey, I want to have judgment. I want to have a heart of, of right judgment, of right justice, of discernment or of discretion in my life. And in his case, he was actually a judge. But even in our lives today, we may not be a judge, but we still need to know God's law just as much as Solomon needed to know God's law. We need to be prepared for a situation where we have to make a, dis a decision in our lives. Discretion, we need to have discernment. Notice, notice that a judging heart is a heart that is able to discern between what? Good and bad. It's making choices, right? Discretion. I'm going to read to you the definition of <coughs> discretion it, from uh, the, Mir I believe this is Merriam-Webster's dictionary. Number one, this is the most common that we use today. The quality of behaving or speaking in such a way as to avoid causing offense or revealing private information. Number two is really the definition more so of what the Bible uses when it says discretion. It says this, the freedom to decide, it says this, what, what should be done in a particular situation. So we need to know what is good and what is bad. We need to know God's law well enough to be able to make the decisions in our lives between good and bad, right and wrong. If you were to look at your life in the past, I guarantee that there's a lot of times where you made poor decisions and you wish, man, I wish I knew God's law. Man, I wish I had the discretion then that I have now. And I wouldn't be in this pickle. I wouldn't be in this type of situation. And sometimes your sins follow you forever. And it's too late. That's right. So it's important to know between good and bad. To be familiar with God's law. In the Bible, you know, uh, the, the, the most unliked or, or, or uh, you know, unsatisfying portion of Scripture to read to most Christians today is what? The law. You know, you know, you, you, people love Genesis. A lot of people want to hear, you know, preaching on Genesis. You know, a lot of people even like the book of Exodus until about halfway through, until you get to Exodus chapter number 20, and then everybody's like, oh man, I think I'm just going to go to Matthew, right? I'm going to skip to the New Testament. That's the attitude of most Christians today. How often, even, you know, in a Bible conversation when you're having with someone, even probably amongst ourselves, you know, more so amongst ourselves, we wouldn't mind this as much because, you know, we are more fundamentalists than the fundamentals today. I have no problem with saying that, but I'll tell you this. When I was growing up, when people are talking Bible, they're normally not talking about Leviticus. Let me just word it that way. They're normally not talking about the law of Exodus. They're normally not talking about some of the things in Deuteronomy. But you know what? You need to love all the Bible. Amen. And you see the importance where he says, hey, you ask for, you know, Solomon asks for discernment. He wants to know good and bad. What does God say? That pleases me. That makes me happy that you want to know between the right, the right decision to make between good and bad, between good and evil. We should have in our hearts the desire to know between good and bad, between right and wrong, between good and evil. <coughs> Turn to Proverbs chapter number 1, verse number 4. We're going to look at the discretion brought up repeatedly. We see right after this that God actually, of course, answers his prayer. We saw that at, uh, by reading in 1 Kings 3 the great wisdom that he had. To be able to make that decision. I remember distinctly the first time I read that and thinking, man, that is an amazing story. That is amazing. There's nothing that reads like the Bible. Right. All of, When you look at like the movies even that end up being blockbusters, a lot of them are just knockoffs of story of like Samson and Delilah. You know, there's, there's stories like that. The Bible has the most amazing stories of any, of, that anyone can ever write. Of course, the greatest story ever told you know, of the Lord Jesus Christ coming. But there's so much greatness in the Bible. You need to love the stories of the Bible. All of it. Now, I want you to listen to, to the response real quick. You're in Proverbs. This is uh, God's further response. So first it said that it pleased the Lord what Solomon had asked. Then it says in verse 11, And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast asked riches for thyself, nor hast asked the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Verse 12, Behold, I have done according to thy words. 
And then he says, Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. Now, of course, Solomon wrote the majority of the book of Proverbs, so we see a lot of talk of discretion and discernment. It would make sense because God gave Solomon such a wise and discerning and you know, discreet, understanding heart that God would use him as you know, the authority, he would inspire scripture through him to be an authority unto us today. That's where you find discretion talked of the most. That's where you, talk, you find discernment talk of, talked of the most is in the book of Proverbs here. So look here in Proverbs chapter number 1, verse number 4. We're going to look at mentions of discretion in the Bible. Look at verse number 3 first. To receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity. Where do we get Wisdom, justice, judgment, true judgment, true justice, equity, that's like something being equal. Where do we get that from? From the law, don't we? From God's word, from the law, that's where we get that from. Look at verse 4. To give subtlety to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. So there's discretion, the importance of having discretion, and it's tied in with justice, judgment, talking about God's law. Further proof of that, look at verse 5. We'll read down. A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsel. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. Look at verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of, of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. What's being taught? The wisdom that God had put in his heart. The wisdom that God had given to Solomon, he is teaching this unto his children. He's teaching this unto his son. And, and then also, of course, the mother is teaching the child. But where are they getting their wisdom from? From the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. That's where we find our wisdom. That's where we find true justice and judgment. That should always be our basis for what is right and wrong. So you need to become familiar with God's law so you can dis discern what decisions to make. Turn to Proverbs chapter 2, verse 11. We'll see discretion used again. Chapter 2, verse 11 says, Discretion shall preserve thee. Notice that. Discretion will keep thee. Why does it say that, that uh, discretion shall preserve thee? Why? Because what discretion is, it, a synonym of discretion in the Merriam-Webster's Dictionary, the very first one is cho a choice or an option. It's knowing which path to choose. Discretion is, in a, a more simpler definition, a discretion is, is a level or a form of wisdom when you are presented with two options and knowing which choice to take. That is a, defini a, a perfect definition of discretion. It is knowing, if a person is discreet, it is knowing what to do and what not to do. When we talk about a woman that's not discreet, what is she doing? She's wearing things that she should not be wearing. She's making a bad decision, right, because she's exposing something that should not be exposed. If she was discreet, she would be hovering that which should not be exposed, right? So she doesn't know between these two choices. She doesn't know what she should be showing and what she shouldn't be showing. She's not able to discern between where that line needs to be drawn, right? Right and wrong. Good and evil. So I want you to look also at, uh, we're going to look at these other mentions, Proverbs 3, 21. Look at Proverbs chapter number 3, verse number 21. My son, let not them depart from thine eyes. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. We see this brought up repeatedly in a book that is written to give you wisdom. It shows the importance of discretion, that specifically, that form of wisdom and the importance of it. Look at Proverbs 5, verse 2. Proverbs chapter number 5, verse number 2. <clears throat> that thou mayest regard discretion, and that thy lips may keep knowledge. Look at Proverbs chapter number 19, verse number 11. Proverbs chapter number 19, verse number 11. It says, the discretion of a man deferreth his anger. And it says, and it is his glory to pass over a transgression. Of course, this is teaching knowing when to be angry about something and when not to be. Notice it's always about a choice. It's you're confronted with a fork in the road, if you will. And you need to know whether you're going to go with option A or option B. Having discretion with God's law. But if you don't know God's law, how's it going to turn out? You have no idea which path to take, do you? You have to first be familiar with what is right and what is wrong. What is true and what is not. And where do we find this wisdom? From the mouth of the Lord. 
from the law, from God's law. So you have to first read the Bible. James chapter number 1, verse number 5 says this, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. What did Solomon pray for and ask for? Prayed for wisdom, didn't he? He prayed for discernment. He prayed for understanding. He prayed for knowing when to, you know, choose the good and when not to choose that which is evil. To be able to discern between the two, didn't he? God says that he gives to all men liberal. I believe the Bible. I believe that if you pray with a sincere heart and you ask God to give you wisdom, that God will give you wisdom. I believe that verse. I believe that that's true. I believe the Bible. Do you believe the Bible? Amen. We should believe the Bible. So if you pray with a sincere heart and you ask God for wisdom, God will give you wisdom. God will give you wisdom. But let me say this at the end of it. Let's say that you never read God's law. You never study it. You don't read the Bible at all. Is God going to give you wisdom there? No. He's not. He has nothing to work with, does he? So of course we need to look at patterns in the Bible. If Solomon was not, you know, did, never picked up. We know what the kings were commanded to do. We're going to look at this in a moment. Every day, they were commanded to read God's word, weren't they? They were commanded to read the Bible. They were commanded to know God's word and to read it. It says actually every day. The kings should have been reading God's word every single day. So we should pray for wisdom, but should we just pray for wisdom and then sit on our butts and never even, you know, take our Bible off of our shelf? You think God's going to answer your prayer then? Does that sound like that's a sincere heart? No, it's not. You don't really want wisdom. That's what's going on. But God will bless you, and, and if, if you're studying God's word, he'll open your eyes like David prayed, to open his eyes, and he'll enlighten you, and he'll endow you with wisdom and understanding, the Bible teaches. I want you to go to Ezekiel chapter number 44, verse number 23. You can ask for wisdom... But you need to ask in a sincere heart, and you need to study God's word, and God will open your eyes, and he will answer that prayer. God does not just, you know, uh, just, just against your own will, and when you ask for a prayer, or you ask for something in prayer, you request something from God, but then you put zero effort forth, you know, you just, you know, show zero interest in actually getting that prayer, you know, on your end, actually getting that prayer answered, God's not going to bless you. That's not how God operates. When God gave the law in the Old Testament, when the, the, the children of Israel were led out of Egypt, right? They, when they were wandering around in the wilderness, God gave them the law. When they got to Canaan, was God just constantly intervening and making sure that they were judging correctly? The priests were supposed to judge, right? And then the kings after that. So was God just constantly intervening and just making sure that the priests were making the right decisions or the kings were making the right decisions? He wasn't, was he? Every time someone broke God's law, did God just like send fiery serpents every single time? You know? No, he did not, did he? What did he expect? He expected the priests to have discernment, didn't he? He expected the priests to have discretion and to know God's law, to be familiar enough with God's law to make the right decisions. And to know what is right and to know what is wrong. And to know when to choose the good and when to refuse the evil. They had to be familiar with God's law. They had to know God's law. So you should be in Ezekiel chapter number 44. Let me turn there myself. This speaks of the priests. Ezekiel chapter number 44. <coughs> Verse number 23. It says, <coughs> am I in the right? No, I'm in the wrong place. Ezekiel 44, 23. It says, and they shall teach my people, watch this, the difference between the holy and profane. It says, and cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. So notice, when they, become, they begin to become familiar with God's law, they can look at it and say, well, that's holy and that's profane. What are they doing? They're discerning between good and bad. And then he says afterwards, and cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. I want you to turn, or I'll read this to you. I'm going to read to you from, you turn to Hebrews 5. I'm going to read to you from 2 Samuel chapter number 14, verse number 17. We've spoken of discernment being, being uh, talked about again. It says this, or I'll, I'll, or I'll read a verse to you about discernment being talked about again. It says, Then thine handmaid said, The word of my Lord, the king, shall now be comfortable. For as an angel of God, so is my Lord the king to discern good and bad. Therefore the Lord thy God will be with thee. So again, see the importance of discerning good and bad. Look at Hebrews chapter 5, New Testament, where this is spoken of. 
perfect example of this sermon. Look at Hebrews chapter number 5, verse number 12. Hebrews 5, 12, it says this. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, <coughs> for he is a babe. Notice he's talking about using the word of God. It's talking about someone not being, you know, uh, uh, you know, fully grown and able to discern between good and evil, right and wrong. It goes on to say, verse number 14, But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use, so notice, by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And evil. So number one, what should we do to get discernment of God's law? We should, we should pray to God. We should pray to God and say, give me an understanding heart to know and to understand your law. What is right and what is wrong? You know, I'll be honest with you, of course, when I read God's law, there are things that are you know, confusing to me as well. I'm sure you would say the same thing. There are sometimes things that I don't understand in God's law. Exactly what should you do when you're presented with this and this? You know, a lot of it is cut and dry, but there are things that are confusing. When you start comparing two situations to one another, and life, and here's the thing, when God gave them the commandments, God gave them the law, he wanted the priests to become familiar with the law well enough that when they're presented with a real life situation, it's not some cookie cutter designed situation, right? You understand what I'm saying? Where it's very simple. No, it's a real life situation where there are multiple things involved. And now you have to know God's law well enough where you can look at it and you can discern between good and bad, right and wrong, what is evil and what is not. So right here you see that it's by reason of use. By reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So number one, we should pray to God and ask him for wisdom. Number two, we should read God's law. We should study God's law to become familiar with God's law and to get discernment. Number three, what do we do? We use it. If you want to read God's law but not use it, you're not going to grow. You're not going to grow in understanding. You're going to stay where you're at. Just like You're not going to understand the practical applications of it if you're not using God's law and actually applying it and making decisions based upon God's law in your life. I want you to turn now to, uh, I'm going to have you turn to Deuteronomy chapter number 17, verse number 18. Deuteronomy chapter number 17, verse number 18. <coughs> Deuteronomy chapter number 17, verse number 18. It says, And it shall be, speaking of the king, when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests, the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them. I want you to notice in verse number 19, verse number 18 first he tells him to, to write out a copy so that he has his own Bible, right? He has his own copy of the law, he says specifically. Then he tells him in verse number 19 that it shall be with him. He's supposed to keep this with him. Why? It says, and because he wants him to. He says, he shall read therein all the days of his life. How often was the king expected to read his Bible in the Old Testament? Think about that. Every day. It says, all the days. Right? Look there again, verse number 19. All the days of his life. God expected that king to read his Bible every day. As I quoted to you already in Revelation chapter number 1, verse number 6, the Bible says that Jesus hath made us, it says he, speaking of Jesus, hath made us, made us kings and priests unto God. He hath made us kings and priests. You are a king in the New Testament. You are a priest in the New Testament. Do you know how often you should be reading your Bible? Every day. Every day. A day should not go by when you are not reading your Bible. You should be reading your Bible every day. And you know why? It's not just, oh, I just want you to read my Bible, but there's no use to it. There's no reason why. I just want you to read the book that I wrote, but there's no reason why, God says. No, look at it. There's, there's of course, everything is practical. Look at the result if you read your Bible all the time. Look at, so there where we read last, all the days of his life, and it says this, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God. What is the result if a person reads their Bible every day? You're going to fear God. 
If you sit down and you read of the judgments of God, the punishments of God, you know what's going to happen? Man, this guy does not play around. He is serious. You know, I'm going to make sure that I don't commit fornication because I know what would happen. I'm going to make sure that I don't commit adultery because I know what would happen. I'm going to make sure that I don't steal from someone because I know what's going to happen. I'm going to make sure that I don't lie to someone because I know what's going to happen. I'm going to make sure that I don't tr transgress anyone's laws, any, any of God's laws, because I know what's going to happen. Right. It should bring the fear of God in your heart when you read the commandments of God and the punishments of God. Amen. That's the importance of reading your Bible every day. You say, oh, I'm just going to skip you know, my Bible reading today. Then I guess you're just not going to fear God. Because you know what happens when you skip your Bible reading today? Then you end up skipping your Bible reading in a couple more days. Then you end up skipping your Bible reading for a week. And then before you know it, you don't fear God anymore. You may fear God today, but if you stop reading your Bible every day, according to the Bible, you will not fear him any longer. The whole reason why God said, Kings, read your Bible every day, is because God knows that the result of that is fearing God. You know why you should read your Bible every day? Because you will fear God if you do. Amen. That's what the Bible teaches. Look at what it says after that as well. It says that he may learn to fear the Lord as God, and then look at this, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes. You know what the result of fearing God is? Keeping God's law. Because you're scared to transgress against God. I don't want to transgress against the Lord God's commandments because I know what he'll do to me. Because I'm fearful of him says to do then verse 20 also look at this that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren so what does that mean you know what god's law does to you when it, when it keeps you fearful it keeps you keeping his commandments it keeps you humble right. saying that his heart's not going to you know why because you're reading about <coughs> a couple of things number one you're reading about the sinful nature that mankind has mm -hmm. how sinful that you are how sinful that all of us are and it puts you into your place the Bible is a book that puts mankind in its place constantly. All throughout the Bible, God is correcting man, talking about how wicked man is, how evil man is, constantly. You know what? And it says there's none righteous. Read Romans chapter number three every once in a while, and you'll walk away, you know, being humble. Your heart will not be lifted up. Read that twice a day, Romans chapter number three. And you will walk away with a humble heart. Read the, the law every night before you go to sleep just as an experiment. Read through the law, the portions specifically of where God is talking about the judgments on man. You'll walk away fearing God. That's the result of, of, of reading the Bible. So do you know what you need to do? You need to read your Bible constantly. Number one, ask for wisdom so that you can discern between right and wrong. Number two, don't just expect God to bless you and to give you something that you're not working for at all. God will give it to you in sincerity. If you're asking in sincerity, something you don't really care about, something that doesn't really matter to you, God is not going to give it. Was Solomon sincere when he asked? Yes. He was. That's why he received the, you know, uh, the, he received his request. So number one, pray for wisdom. God says he'll give it to you liberally. He upbraids not saying he doesn't hold anything back. So he will give it to you liberally. God will give you wisdom if you ask for wisdom, for discretion. For wisdom of understanding and knowing God's law. Number two, read your Bible. Read your Bible. Number three, what did we see? You need to exercise. You need to use it. You need to start trying to find you know, areas in your life where you're not applying God's law. And make the right decisions. <clears throat> so we see here that the kings were commanded to read the Bible. To make a copy of it. To read it every day so that they would fear the Lord. They would be humble. And then also there at the end, to, or in the middle, to keep all the words of this law. So that's the importance of reading your Bible every day. Another thing is this. You need to know the law of the Old Testament. But as a New Testament Christian, you need to have more discernment than the Old Testament Christian. Do you know why? Because there's been changes in God's law. That's what discernment means. It's dividing. It's a choice, right, between this and that. There's been changes in God's law in the New Testament, right? So you know what you need to do? You need to know your Bible even better than the Old Testament Christians did. Because they don't have a New Testament that's telling them, hey, and I'm referring to people that were living under the Old Covenant, right? The Israelites. They didn't have changes that they had to study out and figure what's applicable to me today and what's not. There are things that are not applicable to you today that were applicable to them of the Old Testament. Do you know what that means? You need to know your Bible better than they did even. Think about that. There are things you need to understand today that they didn't understand in the Old Testament. Right? 
What, and you know what? We see modern Christians failing at this horribly bad. What do they do? They have some sort of sin in their life, right? They have some sort of sin in their lives. And what do they always just write it off on? Well, that's Old Testament if you point it out. What are they doing? They don't have discernment. They, they're not, they don't have discretion to know what's, what has been changed and what has not been changed. They don't know why. Because they're not familiar with God's law. Do you think these people are reading their Bibles every day? Come on. Not a chance, right? No way. Why? Why do they, why do they give you these silly answers? Because they don't have discretion. Why do they not have discretion? Because they don't know God's law. Do you think these people are praying for wisdom like Solomon prayed for wisdom? No. We need to read God's law in the New Testament even more and be more familiar with the law of the Old Testament. We need to read God's word today and be more familiar with the, with the law of the Old Testament even than they were at that time. Because there are things that have changed. Colossians chapter number 2 verse 15, I read this. Uh, 15 and 16, I read this last week, but it says, or two weeks ago. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath day. So notice there's been changes in the New Testament. There's been changes in God's law. And you need to be familiar with God's law so that you know what decisions to make. I want you to look at Judges chapter number 11, verse number 30. We're actually going to end here. I'm going to give you an example of someone who failed at this and how drastic that it was. So this is Judges chapter number 11, verse number 30. What could be the result of not being able to discern God's law and not being familiar <coughs> with God's law? I'm going to point out, you know, there's different <clears throat> explanations of what they believe, you know, uh, of what be people believe happened here in this story. But I'm going to show you the Bible's very clear of what happened. And the reason why there are, there are other explanations is because people don't want to admit what happened in this story. Look at Judges chapter number 11, verse number 30. It says this. <coughs> And Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord, and said, If thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into mine hands, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace from the children of Ammon, shall surely be the Lord's. And then he says this, And I will offer it up for a burnt offering. So what does he say that he's going to do to whatever comes forth to his door? He's going to offer it up as a what? A burnt offering, right? If you pick up a Schofield reference Bible, and, and the first three or four times that I read through the Bible, I had a Schofield reference Bible. And I remember, if it, you know, I'll, I didn't read the notes very often, but if I had something that puzzled me, that felt wrong, or I didn't really know what the answer was, I'd look at the notes and see what he said. And I looked at the notes. At that time, I didn't know, you know, all the corruptions of Schofield and things along those lines. So I looked at the notes on this portion. And, and I'm going to explain to you what he says in a moment, and he's totally wrong. Totally wrong. So right here it says, that he's going to offer it up. Whatever comes to the door, he's going to offer it up as a burnt offering. Verse 32, so Jephthah passed over unto the children of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord delivered them <coughs> into his hands. Verse 33, and he smote them from a rower, even till thou cometh the minute, even twenty cities. And under the plain of the vineyards with a very great slaughter. Thus the children of Ammon were subdued before the children of Israel. And Jephthah came to Mizpah unto his house. And behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and with dances. And she was his only child. Beside her he had neither son nor daughter. Okay, stop right there. What did he say that he was going to do to the first thing that came forth? He was going to offer it up as a burnt offering. Okay, look at verse 30 through 35. And it came to pass when he saw her that he rent his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, thou hast brought me <coughs> very low, and thou art one of, <coughs> excuse me, one of them that troubled me. Look at what he says. For I have opened my mouth unto the Lord, and I cannot go back. When he opened his mouth, what did he say that he was going to do? Offer his daughter. And this may be redundant, but he said he's going to offer his daughter up as a burnt offering. And what does he say afterwards? He says, I cannot go back. Why is he sorrowful? Why is he mourning? What was he going to do? He's going to offer her as a burnt offering. I mean, what's the plain reading of the text? It's very clear. It's very plain. That's why he's, he's sad and he's panicking and he's freaking out, isn't it? What if a lamb would have came up? What was he going to do? 
offer it as a burnt offering. Did he expect his daughter to be the one that walked up? Of course not. That didn't even pop into his mind. But what came first to meet him at the door was his daughter. And he rents his clothes. And, you know, it was, you know, and I want you to go ahead and keep your hand here and turn to Ecclesiastes chapter number 5. So he's renting his clothes, and it says in verse 36, And she said unto him, My father, if thou hast opened thy mouth unto the Lord, watch this, do to me according to that which hath proceeded out of thy mouth. So whatever you vowed, she's saying, just do that to me. Which was, of course, to offer whatever that was that came forth to meet him as a burnt offering. For as much as the Lord hath taken vengeance for thee of thine enemies, even of the children of Ammon. <coughs> and she said unto her father, let this thing be done for me. Let me alone two months that I may go up and down from the, upon the mountains. Go up and down upon the mountains and bewail my virginity. I and my fellows. Verse 38. And he, and, and he said, go. And he sent her away for two months. And she went with her companions and bewailed her virginity upon the mountains. So the plain reading of the text is that he said he was going to do that, which he had proceeded out of his mouth. His daughter says, do whatever proceeded out of your mouth. He says when she comes, I vow to vow and I cannot go back. On what? The words that proceeded out of his mouth. The plain reading of the text is that he's going to offer her up as a burnt offering. Then we see her bewailing her virginity. Why? Because she's going to die a virgin. That's why. She's going to die as a virgin. She's going to, she's about to you know, be offered as a burnt offering. Okay? Look at verse 39. And it came to pass at the end of two months that she returned unto her father. Now I want you to pay close attention to this next phrase. This is the proof of what took place. Who did with her according to his vow which he had vowed. That's the Holy Spirit saying... He did the exact same thing according to his vow of which he said he was going he to vow. What he said he was going to do in the vow. What did he do according to the Bible? Everyone. Offered her up as a burnt offering. It's super plain. It's the plain reading of the text, right? So, there are multiple things that we can learn from this. Multiple things that we can learn from this. Number one is you need to know God's law well enough, number one. To fear the Lord and to take God's law serious. You don't just flippantly make a vow like that. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter number 5, verse number 4. When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thine hands? Look, uh, Deuteronomy chapter number 23, verse number 21 says this. <clears throat> when thou shalt vow a vow unto the Lord thy God, thou shalt not slack to pay it, for the Lord thy God will surely require it of thee, and it would be sin in thee. But if thou shalt forbear to vow, it shall be no sin in thee. That which is gone out of thy lips thou shalt keep and perform, even a free will offering, according as thou hast vowed unto the Lord thy God, which thou hast promised with thy mouth. Now, he vowed a free will offering, right? He just stood there on his own. God never told him to do this. He just vowed a vow, didn't he? And said, this is what I'm going to do. And what does the Bible tell you if you do something like that? You shall, it says, you know, be committed unto that vow. You shall follow through with that vow, right? Okay. Well, I want you to turn to, what's the other passage? Go to Leviticus chapter number 20, verse number 2. I want you to go to Leviticus chapter number 20, verse number 2. Now, <clears throat> let me say this. In general, if you vow a vow, you better keep the vow. That is, what, that is a commandment of God. You shall, if you vow a vow, you shall keep that vow. There are people today, Christians, a male and a female, who stand up at a so-called altar and they say vows to one another, when, you know, whether it's good or whether it's bad, till death do us part, don't they? And what do they do? A year later, five years later, they're out of there. It wasn't really till death do us part. It wasn't really, it was, you know, it was really if it's good. It wasn't if it's bad. That's really what it was. And what do they do? They break that vow constantly. Christians, Christians stand up and they vow a vow. What does the Bible say? If you want to vow a vow, you better keep it. It'd be better not to even vow in the first place. Why? Because it's sin if you end up breaking that vow, isn't it? It's sin against the Lord, right? <clears throat> Here it is 
uh, we're going to read in Leviticus chapter number 20, <coughs> verse number 2. This is just one scripture, I believe, of, of four or five scriptures that I can turn you to. Showing that child sacrifice is condemned in the Bible. Child sacrifice is condemned in the Bible. Sometimes critics of the Bible will try to say otherwise. And they'll use the passage that we just looked at in one other thing. And I wanna, I'm going to speak on this for maybe about five more minutes and I'll be finished. But look at Leviticus chapter number 20, verse number 2. Again, thou shalt say to the children of Israel, Whosoever he be of the children of Israel or of the strangers that sojourn in Israel that giveth any of his seed unto Moloch, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. And I will set my face against that man and will cut him off from among his people because he hath given of his seed unto Moloch to defile my sanctuary and to profane my holy name. And if the people of the land do any what ways hide their eyes, from the man, when he giveth of his seed <coughs> unto Molech, and kill him not, then I will set my face against that man, and against his family, and will cut him off, and all that go a whoring after him, to commit whoredom with Molech from among their children. So we have two things being condemned here. Number one is the worshiping of Molech, and the sacrificing of a child unto Molech. Now someone may try to look at this and say, well, it's not necessarily that they're sacrificing their child, it's because they're sacrificing their child unto Molech. Well, let me say this. Number one, you read all throughout the Bible, there is never a time when the Bible says, hey, you should sacrifice your children. God asks of a sacrifice of a child unto him. If you, know, if you were to speak to an atheist, they'd say, well, what about Abraham? The Bible plainly tells you that when Abraham took Isaac, he was testing him. And before he went to actually, you know, sacrifice his son, the, the angel came and said, don't, don't, don't do that. Stop. Right beforehand. Why? Because that was not all right. He was testing him. Never in the Bible ever does, does God ask to sacrifice a child unto him. The Bible has clear laws of when someone is to be killed and what is to be sacrificed. Think about that very, very carefully. There are specific times in which someone is to be put to death, and it's when they transgress certain laws which call for the death penalty. There are certain things that are to be sacrificed, specific things, and it's never a person, ever. God never requests or asks for a child to be sacrificed. So what would you be doing if you just took an innocent person, whether child or not, and offered them as a burnt offering? You would be murdering that person, according to the Bible. It doesn't matter. Did God specify in the way in which you kill someone? Well, if you offer them as a burnt offering, then it's all right. What if I just took Brother Hall and offered Brother Hall as a burnt offering today? It's ridiculous, but what would that be? What would I be committing? Murder, murder right? I would be murdering Brother Hall, wouldn't I? It doesn't matter the way in which Brother Hall dies. It wouldn't matter what weapon or what way I kill Brother Hall. It would be murder. Did God ask? Now have discernment when reading the text, number one. Did God tell or ask Jephthah, to offer his daughter as a burnt offering. It was a free will offering, wasn't it? It came out of what? His own mouth, didn't it? He chose you know, to make this vow, didn't he? And he didn't know what was going to be coming to his door, and who did it end up being? His daughter. Was he aware of that? And let me ask you this question. If he wouldn't, I want, I'm going to ask you two questions, yes or no. If he wouldn't, have fulfilled or went through with the with the vow, would he have been sinning? Yes. yes. If, which she was, an innocent person who should not have died, and he killed her, it doesn't matter whether it's an offering or not, did he sin against God? Yes, yes he did. He did sin against God, didn't he? He murdered his daughter. That's what he did. The Bible never approves of what he did ever in the Bible. Ever. One time, never says this was good. Is bad. You know what you need to do? You need to know God's law. There are stories in the Bible where men do bad things. And do you know why they're there? To be an example unto you. To know what not to do. That's why they're there. There are bad examples. You know, there are, are examples of people doing bad things in the Bible. Do you know why they're there? Because God expects you to read the Bible, to read God's law, to look at it and have discernment and apply it to your life. Now, you know what Jephthah should have done? What's a worse sin? To break a vow or to murder his daughter? Murder. murder. So here's, here's what the truth is. Sometimes you make a decision in your life and it puts you 
at a fork in the road where the only two options you have are sin. That's a fact. You have no way out of it. That I, he had already vowed about. Let me ask you this question. Let me demonstrate this to you further, that that's what's going on with Jephthah. What if Jephthah would have vowed a vow that, you know, whatever comes to my, to my door, I'm going to offer it up to Molech. Think about that for a minute. Does it matter whether it's being offered to Molech or it's being, or it's being offered to the Lord? Is that what actually made that sin? Think about that. Do you understand what I'm saying? It wouldn't have mattered. So if he would have not kept his vow, what would he have been doing? He would have been sinning against God, wouldn't he? Because he vowed a vow, right? He could have vowed the vow to the Lord, but told the Lord that he's going to offer it to Molech, the seed unto Molech. When God said, don't offer the seed unto Molech, he could have said, hey, Lord, I'm going to vow a vow to you that if you help us defeat these enemies, then I'm going to commit adultery on my, on my wife. Think about that as an example, a terrible example. What would have happened if he didn't keep the vow? This is the truth. He would have sinned against God. He shouldn't have made the vow. What would have happened if he would have kept the vow? He would have sinned against God. There's no way out of it. You know why? Because he made a bad decision when he came to the law. Because he, number one, flippantly just vowed a vow. That's why the Bible says don't vow a vow. Because if you break it, it's sin. Be careful with what vows you vow. You understand what I'm saying? You need to, you know what would have happened? It makes me believe that maybe Jephthah wasn't reading his Bible. He didn't know the law well enough because you know what he would have done? He would have feared the Lord more. He, you know what he would have done? He would have, he would have had more reverence for God's law and not just said, I'm just going to you know, vow, I'm going to make a vow that whatever comes to my will, not just flippantly making. If you knew the consequence of something like that, if you took God's law serious, you wouldn't just be making these crazy vows, would you? So if he would have broken the vow, he would have sinned against God. If he would have, which he did, offer his daughter up as a burnt offering, he sinned against God. He murdered his daughter, and he offered his seed in the fire. Whether it's to Molech or not, that's what he did. And that's sin, according to the Bible. It's murder, according to the Bible. He killed an innocent person. He was the one that, that conjured up this idea in his own mind, that I'm just going to offer whatever comes to the door. So you know what he should have done in that situation? And this is the truth. He should have had discernment with God's law. And he should have been familiar enough with what is a greater sin against God. This is the point that I want to end on. And I know that everyone in here is familiar with this. Very quickly, just a couple of minutes. The Bible teaches that there are greater sins in the Bible. The Bible teaches that there are greater sins in God's law. And I'm not going to, we're not going to turn to any of these particular passages. But I'll quote a couple to you. I'll give you a couple of examples. You know, in 1 John, the Bible talks about a sin unto death and a sin that's not unto death. Number one. Number two, it, the Bible talks about how when Jesus was brought to Pilate, Jesus says out of his own mouth that those that delivered him to Pilate committed the greater sin. What does that mean if there's greater? That means there are sins that are less. They're not equal, Right? So there are greater sins than some sins, right? Another example is when, uh, one that you're probably not familiar with is when Aaron comes down from the mount, or when, I'm um, sorry, when Moses comes down from the mount and Aaron had fashioned the calf. If you go back and read it, he says specifically, Moses says specifically to Aaron, why have you brought such great a sin upon this thy people? What does that mean? This is a really bad sin. This is a sin that's worse than a lot of other sins. So, you know, sometimes you can make a bad decision in your life where now, you know what, I'm stuck now because I made a bad decision. And I don't know how to get out of this. You know what you need to do? It's left up to you, O king, O priest, to judge and discern God's law. And then all of a sudden you see the importance of being familiar with God's law. When, when your bad decision can cause you know, hurt on someone else, hurt on your family, hurt on a family member, hurt on a work, you know, a fellow worker, hurt on a church member, whatever it may be, people that you're around and related to in life, you don't know what position it's going to be in. And then all of a sudden, you know what you're going to wish? Man, I wish I knew God's law a little bit better. I wish I'd know the result if I made this decision, what's going to happen, what's going to come after this, or the result if I took option A or option B. I want, you should know what's going to happen. And how God is going to react to you and what the punishment is going to be like and whether you're going to be causing someone else to be hurt or someone else to be punished as well. It's very clear of what he did. He offered her as a burnt offering, number one. We can see that in the passage. 
We look at God's law, it's wrong to murder someone, and that's clearly what he did. It doesn't matter how she died. The Bible condemns offering your seed you know, unto Molech, but it's a part of that is you know, you're burning an innocent person in the fire. That's condemned all throughout the fire, all throughout the Bible. You know why it specifically mentions Molech? Because God doesn't ask you to do that. And it's only barbaric heathens that did such things. That's why. That's sin. So he was stuck in a position, you know what you need to do? You need to read your Bible. You need to ask for wisdom, number one. This is a practical sermon to apply to our lives. You need to ask for wisdom from God. And if you're sincere, just like he gave Solomon wisdom, he'll give you wisdom. To be able to discern and have discretion in your life. You know what else you need to do? You need to read your Bible every day. Every day you need to read your Bible. To fear the Lord, to know the law, to keep the law, and to be humble. You know what else you need to do? You need to exercise judgment. You need to use God's law in your life. You need to apply it in areas. You need to be familiar with God's law. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father God, <coughs> we thank you for, for the good examples in the Bible and for the bad examples, dear Lord. We thank you for everything that you've done for us in our lives thus far, and we're very thankful for the Bible itself, dear Lord, and, and for all the wisdom that's contained in it. Help us to study it, and just please open our eyes. Help us to have a sincere heart and to, and to desire wisdom and discretion and discernment. Dear Lord God, we ask you to be with us and, and bless us in all areas of our life. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen.